all we're left with with our normal arrangement are vocals. The thing about this record and this band is that the vocals are phenomenal. The singer has such a distinctive voice and delivery and the energy is just awesome. I'm going through my usual chain. If you look at the video about my template and the way I set up sessions, you'll know that there's sort of a clean vocal path and there's a very compressed vocal path. And I'm using that Pultec compressed vocal path all the way through. So here's the lead vocal without the Pultec. Well, I can see what it is. I can see what's on my mind. Oh. And we'll go back up to the vocal track itself to see what processing there is. But really quickly, here is the chain that is the Pultec pulling out the low end, adding a bunch of 8K, getting compressed, and then having the low end added back in. And if you want a more detailed explanation, definitely check out the video about the template because I go through this specifically. But basically what it acts like is a three band compressor with the low and the high bands bypass. So it's, bi it's compressing the mid range of the vocal a lot and leaving the lows and highs alone. It's a trick that a lot of people used to do with hardware before there were multi band compressor hardware units or plugins available. And it was a way to make the vocal much more present. This is what that sounds like on its own. You can hear there's quite a bit of smash going on there. And this is with the clean channel again, which only has a little bit of Phoenix, tiny bit of compression from Arvox, and then just a limiter to make sure we don't actually peek out on the way out of this channel. Well, I can see what it is. I can see what's on my mind. Oh. Well, I can see what it is. I can see what's on my mind. Oh. It's a parallel compressor, basically, but it's a really specific sound. Um, I've never even tried this on anything other than vocals. It might be good, but it, it's so specific to the frequency range of the vocal, and it just makes the vocal incredibly intelligible and present. So you can have the vocal a lot quieter, and it'll still pop through the mix. Now, that said, let's go up to the vocal itself and see what's going on, because here's some stuff, some of which was left over from their session. So they're compressing the vocal quite a bit, and I think without that, you'll hear that it's really not the same vocal sound. Well, I can see what it is. I can see what's on my mind. Oh, because my heart don't beat like it should, and I can't stop crying. This all buttons in compression is a big part of the vocal sound. It's that spitty thing that brings up all of the little tiny details, all of the little breaths, and all the vibrato comes out much more. So it's a big part of the sound. After that, there's a decapitator just to basically decapitate it a little bit, a little bit of clipping. Well, I can see what it is. I can see what's on my mind. Oh, because my heart don't beat like it should and I can't stop crying. So much more appropriate with that distortion. And then that is followed by an API EQ. So this would have been in the session because I don't think it would have occurred to me to put an API on the vocals. Adding a little bit of mid-range, both the 2.5K and 3K, which is interesting, you're actually moving the shelf down below the mid-range bump. You're basically just adding a bunch of presence here. And then 1K here, so you can see 1K, 2.5, and 3K all being added, but only a little bit, and then leaving the low end alone. Well, I can see what it is, I can see what's on my mind, oh, because my... This is bringing out what's below what the Poltec LA-2A Poltec chain brings out. So that's much more of the presence, and this is much more of that mid-range intelligibility. And, I mean, I still think of it as presence, but technically it's a little bit below where presence would be. But I feel like it's the tone of the vocal itself is being brought out here. It's being sent off to the plate and to bus 15, which let's see if bus 15 is actually anything which is the slap. These are some effects that came in with their session, and I just never had to change them. Now, I could have moved these sends down to my vocal bus here, which is where everything gets combined and sent off to the mix bus. I may have actually tried that at one point, but then the vocal is just way too loud going into their reverb and their slap, 
And I liked the balance of what was going on. Their slap is just an Echo Boy, pretty straight ahead, 117, 125 stereo slap. And it's also not 100% wet, which is interesting. It's the way they set it up. So part of the level of the vocals actually coming from the return of the slap. It's a bit messy for it to be that way, but I also just decided I didn't really even care because it was working. So if the balance works, as long as it's something I can work with and I don't get into something where now all of a sudden I can't turn the vocal up or down, then I'm fine to leave stuff the way it's set up. Now, also, the plate which we saw earlier in the slap that we just looked at are going off to the kit bus, which is an interesting place for them to go. This would have been something that they did in their session so that these effects are actually going through the drum kit bus. Most likely because they wanted them to pump a little bit along with the drums, and again, it just worked. There's no reason not to do it. So I just left it that way. So every once in a while some stuff comes in that either was done by accident or was done on purpose very quickly while the session was being worked on. If it's working, don't undo it unless it's going to hamper you later. Definitely don't keep things in the session if it's going to tie your hands or if you just can't really figure out how the stuff is interacting. But otherwise, there's no reason to change something that's working. So in this case, there's a bit of a bizarre routing going on with the vocal effects, but I'm fine with it. So that is the lead vocal. The only thing that's going on is the send to my stereo vocal crush, which is yet another 1176 with all buttons in. And this is all just for grit. And I'll show you the vocal with and without. Well, I can see what it is. I can see what's on my mind. Oh, because my heart don't beat like it should. And I can't stop crying. Oh. So you can hear a lot of the sort of dry level of the vocals coming from there. Some of that is because of the way the vocals are being sent to the effect. So when I mute that, what I'm muting is a dry vocal going to there, as opposed to the vocal having the effects after going to this parallel compressor. So my vocal will have a different amount of effects depending on how much of the parallel compression I use. That could seem as though it's very unwieldy, but again, I build this vocal sound up very, very quickly and it works. And if I need more effects by turning that send up, I will get more effects. So it still works, it's just a little bit unorthodox, but in this case, I really don't think it had any detrimental effect on the way I was mixing the song. The vocal just sounds good, and off we go. The only other place the vocal is going is into the rear bus. So it meets up with the entire rest of the mix, and everybody starts to interact. Just like you heard before I had the vocals in, now the vocals are part of that rear bus mess. And once we get the background vocals in, I'll go back and do the rear bus on and off. The drums will get a little bit too loud, but you'll really hear that interaction between the vocals, the strings, the horns, and then all the other instruments that we've listened to before. The other sends that are to my traditional vocal effects are off, which is the Aphex to get some top end, the vocal reverb, which is just a plate, and the spread, which is a little micro pitch slap, so short delay with pitch shift. They already have the effects that are mimicking this exact same thing. I like the way they sounded. I kept theirs. I never turned mine on. So it came in with the template but I never bothered to turn those sends on. The last thing in terms of musical elements are the background vocals, which are quite cool. I'm just gonna jump around and play you what they are so you can hear what's going on. Really strong, soul, almost choir female background vocals. They sound great. You can see there are no plugins going on on individual tracks, except this one has a little bit of, well, quite a bit of brilliance, so I can play what's going on there just to have a listen. Since you've been gone. Since you've been gone. It's just doing exactly what it says, bring a little presence out. But then all of these vocals are being collected down into a BV bus, which, when I got it, had an LA-2A on it. And this I bypassed because I just didn't like what it was doing. It must have been crushing too much, especially because I still have my stereo vocal crush that I'm going to put on it. 
we'll just get rid of that. But they also had one of their 88RS plugins, which would have had some compression and EQ. So let's have a listen to that. Unsolo that, and we'll listen to the big group. So you can see there's a ton of top end being added, which sounds great, and no reason for me not to. So, I mean, you've got a shelf down at 3K. So that's presence, air, all of the above, brighten it up. Sounds really good. Kept that. Then, just like I do on everything else that I do with background vocals, they come up to a copy of what the lead vocal had. So there's a clean track, which has this, the usual harmonic distortion, tiny bit of compression, and then the limiter just to shave off the top. Then it's got the Pultec chain, which is the Pultec into the LA-2A, into the Pultec, and then a little bit of extra bright EQ on the top, just for grain. These vocals wanted to be bright to cut through everything else that was going on. And then those two chains get collected down into a chorus vocal combiner, which is my background vocal combiner. It was called Chorus Vocals for a while. I'm not sure why. And then the only sends I'm using here are... There's a send off to the spread, so we can hear that come and go. So this is with and without the spread. Just a little bit more like a record. You have that little extra delay, which acts like a slap. The little pitch shifting acts like a chorus. It also just sounds like more voices. That sounds great. And then there is the stereo vocal crush, which once again is going to make these nice and aggressive. So here's with. So you can hear that that all buttons in 1176 is a big part of the way those vocals sound. Without it, they still sound really good, but they're kind of flat and they're dark. This not only makes them more aggressive, but it also makes them brighter. Okay, so now that I've introduced all the elements, let me play you the song, and I'm just going to play sort of halfway through the intro, up through the B section. We won't even get to the chorus. But this way, you can remember all the individual elements and hear how the arrangement was put together. But then I'm also going to go back and play it without the rear bus. The drums will jump up in level, but I think you'll hear so much of the interaction that's happening in this mix will go away. After that, I'm going to talk about the two bus chain and then we're going to get to the middle eight. a lot clearer, but it's a hell of a lot less fun to me. So all of that really cool interaction and bounce and vibe is coming from that shared parallel compression that's across the entire mix on this particular mix. Speaking of across the entire mix, I'm going to quickly run through my two bus chain. It's the same as most of the mixes I do. Things are in a slightly different order than some of the other mixes, but there's also a different limiter on this than on pretty much every other project I've mixed. I just happen to use something else on this, trying to be a little more lo-fi. We start off with the Fairchild 670. This is not compressing at all. The threshold 
which is actually a send to the detector circuit, is all the way down. I even have the mix only at 50%. I'm just trying to get a little bit of the harmonic distortion you get by modeling all of the endless tubes and transformers and miles of wire that's inside one of these things. So here's with and without. sounds better with, I would say. Then comes the only compressor in my mix bus chain, Neve 33609. The limiter is out, nothing going on here. There is 2 dB of makeup gain within the compressor circuit. I'm at 1.5 to 1. The attack time is not negotiable on this compressor. You have no control over it. I'm at the fastest release time, 100 milliseconds, which has a very definite sound to it. And I'm going to play you with and without this compressor, and what you're going to hear, I'll play in the verse where it's a little sparser, is the difference in the transient material. Just, it feels completely different to me. Also, the threshold is up all the way, so this is the least amount of compression I can get, given how much level I'm pushing through the compressor. But when I take it out, you'll see that the feel of the mix just completely changes. Now you saw as that was playing that the gain reduction meter is getting up to around 4 dB. That's about as much as I would ever have. This record we really pushed. Um, It was part of the sound of the record was compressing these mixes quite a bit. So that's a little more than I would normally have in terms of the way that the meters are moving. But again, I don't look at these meters. Um, This gets set by the way it sounds. It just turns out that this mix is really pushed, which is part of the sound. Next we've got the Brainworks BX1. This is a mid-side EQ, very little EQ. I have a 1.3 dB shelf at 8K. So it's boosting up the top end on the sides only. But keep in mind that the sides is most of the mix. The only stuff that is not on the sides is the stuff that's exactly in the middle. It's easy when you're processing mid-side to think about the middle as being like this wide and then the sides are over here. The reality is... The middle is just a hair's width that's everything that's exactly mono. Anything that's even slightly stereo is in the side. So this is really a nice EQ on the whole mix, but it isn't right in the middle. Then the other element that I'm using is a stereo width control. This just makes the mix wider. Another thing it does, this mix doesn't have too much of it, but if you have lots of hard panned elements, it can help make them not quite so distracting in headphones because it takes a little bit of the out of phase signal and pops it in the other speaker. In this case, it's really just doing the widening. So play the mix with and without that. On the face of it, we're not doing too much here, but it really changes the way the mix feels to me. I think it's the widening more than the high shelf, but I the high shelf, but I really love what that does to the mix. Next in the chain is a happy face EQ. We've got almost plus three at 100, and then we've got almost plus four at 10K, nice and broad. It's really acting more like a shelf than a bell up that high. This is going to make a huge difference in the mix. We're obviously picking up level because of how much EQ there is, but it doesn't sound like it's just EQ. What it really does is it keeps me from having to EQ a lot on individual tracks. There are two great bonuses to that. One is I can be lazy and not put in a bunch of EQs on individual tracks, but the other thing is I'm not wrenching a ton of EQ that's then going into my parallel compressors. So the tracks are less processed into the parallel compressors. I build up my really nice balance And then I overall crank the top and the bottom, and that sort of completes the sound of the mix to me EQ-wise. So that does a lot. Um, 
In hardware, I always used Langs because Poltex felt too floppy to me. They kind of ring a little bit. The tube amplifier just, I don't know, it doesn't feel as tight. Um, so I've gone through lots of different Poltex style EQs. It doesn't even have to be a Poltex style. It's just something nice and wide. That's the idea. You could even do it with two shelves. It would sort of be the same thing. I like not using a shelf down on the bottom especially because I don't really want to be cranking up tons of stuff at 5 hertz. That's just asking for trouble. Especially when the next thing in the chain, ignore this bypass plug-in for a minute, is your limiter. This particular limiter is just the soft clip inside of this plug-in. At its heart, this is a tape emulation plug-in, and basically somebody just said, hey, you should check out the Satin plug-in, and I checked it out just as I was starting to mix this record. And I felt like I didn't necessarily wish that I could print these mixes to tape, but I wanted to hear like what would happen if I used tape to really smash this up. So I'm going to bypass this, and you're going to hear not a massive difference, but you're going to hear the character of the mix change. And again, it's going to get dirtier and less clear, but this is sort of the finishing touch to all of the dirtiness we've been introducing on individual stuff along the way. It's just that last little bit of sponginess. The soft clip really is just acting like a limiter, but it's the, it's hard to describe it other than that spongy attack. And that's what you would get if you hit tape too hard. And that's exactly what I tried to do on this mix was to get a little bit of that. I'm not going to go into all the specifics on this plugin, but if you're into this kind of thing, you should absolutely pick it up because among other things, it's like a playground down here for noisy, weird stuff. You can move the head bump around, you can misalign the azimuth, you can do all kinds of stuff that you can do on a lot of the tape emulation plugins. And this one just has a cool sound and goes a little bit further out of spec than some of the other ones would go. As promised, we're finally going to get to the middle eight. On this record, and not just on this song, I went down to meet the band before we started, and they played me a couple of songs, and then we had some back and forth, and I don't remember if this was on a Skype or in the initial meeting, but what they said was, as I was saying earlier, that they felt like musically the songs were awesome, loved the arrangements, all the rest of it, but that in the middle eights of these songs, to feel free to kind of go nuts, they felt like sonically they could really go somewhere else. So what I'm going to do is actually play you the original uh, rough mix just of the middle eight. The vocal arrangement is a little bit different, but basically you'll hear the elements that I was given, and they were in no way saying this is the way the middle eight goes. They were saying, here's the raw material, see what you can come up with and make this awesome, which is sometimes intimidating, but it's also, you get to have fun, get to actually really try some stuff and be creative. And as long as the relationship between the artist and the mixer is good and you don't feel like, well, hey, how come I'm finishing your songs for you kind of thing, which can happen. Sometimes you can be left things to do that you shouldn't be. Whereas this was absolutely my chance to just be creative, try anything I wanted, and see what happened. And you'll see as we go through it, I tried some stuff that was terrible and then finally arrived at where we ended up on the record. So here's the way the middle eight came to me. very much set up in two halves. You get the breakdown, then you get things back in, you get the lead vocal coming back strong, um, and they're not necessarily telling me that, okay, this is what should happen structurally and just make it sound different. It was literally, do whatever you want and let's see what happens. The first thing I decided to do was that the track needed to be small. The extra plug-in on my mix bus is just a filter. Now you're going to hear everything, so rather than me play it, I'm just going to show you what happens to the filter as we go. Because if I play it, you're going to hear a hundred other elements come in at the same time, might be confusing. But basically, this is bypassed right up until the downbeat of the middle eight. And then I'm automating. So you can see that the filter closes up here. So the high pass is at 400. 
And then as we go through the middle eight, this will start to open up. Here, let me actually show you. This is the low pass frequency here, and then I'll show you in another playlist the high pass frequency. And you can see that they sit static for the first half, which is the breakdown part. And then they will slowly start to open up as we get to the actual chorus. And then it's gone again, bypassed completely, when we actually get to the downbeat of that final big section. And so this is an overall effect. But the main stuff that I did was all just on individual little effects. Something they gave me to work with was this harp, which is really cool. And it's got their limiter and equalizer on it, as well as having an echo boy. These are effects that they gave me. So there's no point in listening without it. That's the sound of the instrument. So one of the very first things I did was decide, let me pan that left, and then let me take each individual chord and reverse it. So I just made a copy of the track. It's a duplicate, even has the same plugins. There's no reason why they've moved over a slot. That just happened. And I pan that hard right. So now we have a forwards version and a backwards version going left to right. So it should sweep across. Getting a lot more motion out of that right away. So that's the very first thing I did. So the next element in the middle eight, which I did a very similar thing to, is the piano, which is just doing a high octave melody that walks through the entire middle eight. So I did the exact same thing. I made a copy of the piano track. I took every single note and individually turned them backwards. Now there's a very quick way to do this, by the way. So let me walk you through this so that you can see what's going on. If you make a copy of the track, then that gives you all of the same plugins if you want them, but it gives you the same sends and it goes to the mix bus, whatever. It's the quickest way to do it instead of making a new track. Then copy the audio to the new track. Then once it's copied, let's pretend now this is a copy. If you use tab to transient, which is on here, you can actually just tab yourself to each individual note and split the region. Now, if I want to reverse these guys, but I want them to stay in place as opposed to reversing the entire piano, the easiest way to do it would be just to come up here to audio suite and hit reverse, then render the next one, then render the next one. But if you have a bunch of regions and you say create individual files clip by clip, what it will do is take each individual region, apply the audio suite process in place. So what it does is it takes every single note, turns it backwards, but leaves it in the same timing as the original forwards note. So that's how I do that quickly. It, believe me, if I had to do these individually, I probably wouldn't even do it half the time because it's just a lot of work. Take the reverse of the same part, auto pan it a little bit. So this is different where before I had that auto heart part, put it on the left, have the reverse be on the right, it sweeps along. This, leave the piano in the middle, which is where the piano already is, because it's a discrete element of the song that's already existed. But then take a backwards version and pan it behind it, and I'm panning into the reverb. So the idea being that the dry piano is panning, and any time there's a note that's going to really hit the reverb, that reverb trail gets left behind in the stereo field, wherever the pan was at that point. If I put it through the reverb first and then panned it, it would just be a different effect. It's the idea of when you build effects, do I want to pan the reverb or reverb the pan? In this case, I wanted to reverb the pan. So together, this is what the piano does now. And because of the speed of the auto pan, it's not set to be rhythmic, really. But it just happens to be where it keeps landing with the long notes on the left, which is fine. Probably every mix I printed, it was different. That auto pan is not a huge part of what the middle eight sounds like, but it's just another moving atmospheric thing. So the next element, which starts to get even freakier here, is the pizzicato strings, which, if I bypass the special part of the effect, just have a little bit of EQ here, and maybe some compression. Again, this is left over from their session that they sent. And then some lo-fi, which I may have added before I found the effect I was going to add.
right? Just make him a little present, bring him out. But then the big guy here is the lady, which is delay backwards. So it's reversing delay. And it also has pitch shift in it. So what I'm doing is, if you see this automation lane, I'm automating the mix knob so that we get a little bit more of this effect as the section continues. So I'm going to play you from the top of this section, and you'll start to hear these higher pitch backwards delays coming in. Come on. And this is without it. This effect was very much inspired by the fact that the lyric is raindrops. And I just thought, well, that's what I need. I need the sound of raindrops. So to me, the pits going through this pitch shifted delay became the rain. Here's the piano, the reverse piano, the harp, the reverse harp, and the glock, and the pits. And then add to that the clean background vocals. So you can hear the contrast between the dry vocals and this very atmospheric mess going on underneath, which is exactly what I wanted to have happen. Now you'll also notice there was another element in here, and what that is, is that's part of me trying to figure out, well, how do I transition into this section? Because, let me take out a couple of things that I added. So this is the way we got from the chorus into the middle eight. It's cool, but it just sounded very abrupt. So I thought, well, let me take a couple of things and make them sustain. So the first most obvious one was I added a reverb to the drums. And if we look at this break verb, it is an alti verb. It's a spring. It's just yet another long spring. And now I'll solo up the drums so you can hear what happens. Shazam! There's a little downbeat, but it's not enough, and it sounded a little tricky, and I can sort of hear it. thought, well, what else is playing on the downbeat? Well, there are guitars here, which I actually made to do this transition. Right, and lots of reverb on those guys. But then even that wasn't enough, so I came down to the horns, and I actually bounced the horns. And I'm going to get rid of the effect. And so the first thing I did was just to bounce that last chord of the horns, and then use Verify to slow it down. Really typical tape stop thing, but when you add... A crazy delay, fab filter, because it's fab, like fab, actually. Then, this is what you get, and this is the final raindrop element. I'm automating the feedback control so that I can actually switch it off. So once the track starts building, I get rid of that. Now, you might think, Andrew, you're a genius. All of those elements work together so well. How could you do that all in one pass? Well, the reality is this took me a long time over the course of several days. I would keep coming back to this and hear it, thinking I'd done it, and it was terrible. Like, oh, God, all right, I'll work on this some more. You know, there was a ton of experimentation to get this middle eight right. But once it was right, and the biggest part to me wasn't even the sound of the middle eight itself, it was the transition into it. It's this idea of 
this steam train just rolling from the very beginning of the song. It's relentless, and all of a sudden you just go off a cliff and you're floating. And then being able to pick up on the lyric raindrops was just sort of an added bonus. I really like the way that stuff sounded. But together, what it lets you do is have this complete break from the song, change up the vocal a little bit, not have it come in as strong. It comes in much more filtered. I just made a copy of the vocal and took out all the low mids so that it's a lot quieter in that section. And it just really gives you a total reset and this other sonic space to be in, and then the track comes back, hits you over the head, and we go out. So I'm going to play from just before the middle eight into the last chorus so you can kind of hear the whole effect. So it's all very organic in the way that it happens, and hopefully it doesn't shock you into not listening to the song anymore, which that would be the problem if you go too far. But it does the job of emotionally kind of sending you off somewhere. So when the band comes back in fully, it sounds really tight and tough again, and it's something you haven't heard in a second. Basically, that's that. That is the heavy, since you've been gone, really creative, really fun, really different from a lot of the stuff I work on just in terms of how stylized the recording is, because a lot of people tend to record very safely, and these guys do not. They just go for it. Um, And also a lot of creative leeway and room to try things and not worry about failing. That was kind of the biggest thing, was to be comfortable enough in what I was doing that I could send them something that was terrible, thinking it was okay. They say, that's terrible, and I don't curl up in a ball and want to die. I actually think like, okay, great, let me go back and make this better. Now that they've said what they don't like about it, I hear it, and I think I have an idea of what to do better. So really creative and, uh, and a lot of fun to work on. So hope you enjoyed it.